Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 92, the history of the Minnesota Blades AAA Hockey Club, with CEO Terrence Moore. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we spend some time chatting about one of the oldest, if not the oldest, AAA hockey clubs in Minnesota, some of their key founding members, and begin the conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series, where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota, or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's Sweet hockeycoach.com and watch the video on the home page for instructions. Thanks and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today I have Terrence Moore on the show. I know him as Terry Moore and he's the current CEO of the Minnesota Blades AAA Hockey Club. The Blades has a special place in my heart as I help coach a team within the organization each season for close to 20 years. Mr. Moore is going to sit down with me today and talk a little Minnesota Blades hockey history, what's so special about this particular AAA program, how are players recruited, the Brick Tournament, Blades alumni, and pay tribute to one of its founding members, John Arco. We have a lot to talk about, so ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Terrence Moore to the show. Mr. Moore, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Well, Lance, thanks a lot. It's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, I think it's great that somebody is talking about what the hockey journey is like from all the dozens, if not hundreds, of different paths people take to life in hockey. So thanks for doing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, you're very welcome. And I, I've, I've really enjoyed um, just reconnecting with a lot of players that and coaches that I've had in the past and to interview people who uh, I believe are masters in their domain in Minnesota here, a Barry Karn, a Scott Bukes that I'd put on, you know, uh, the Nesses on what, what that would be. But um, so you're a hockey guy. We're going to get, let me read you something. You're right now currently a lawyer. Terry Moore has a reputation as a bulldog lawyer by being aggressive, tenacious, and practical. He has successfully taken on major league adversaries such as Big Oil, Big Pharma, and Big Government, both in litigation and transactions. Over the past 30 years, he has won more than $150 million for his clients. Are you rich, Terry? Uh, no, I'm not <laughs> rich. I get paid by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, uh, your game is is being a lawyer, and there's probably several movies that uh, can relate to uh, the type of experiences that you've had over the years and that. Uh, I want to get to that, and we're going to talk to it, but how I like to start, there's a hockey tie here, how I like to start all the shows I think it's important to give the listeners, especially if they don't know who a person is that I'm interviewing, a little background information on this person I'm interviewing. So if you don't mind, let's go back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Uh, your family members, friends, introduction to hockey and other sports. Basically, tell us a little bit about what the heck it was like growing up, Terry Moore. Well, it... it... I'll take you all the way back to the beginning, even before I started playing. Uh, my brother was a mite. We lived in the Irondale system in the city of New Brighton. That's Minnesota. New Brighton, Minnesota, yep. And uh, we were at Sunnyside Park. I was probably six years old. Uh, 
and watching my brother play an outdoor hockey game. And uh, I said to my dad, boy, that number 10 on the other team is pretty good. And my dad said, yeah, he's got seven goals so far. Uh, that number 10 was Scott Bukestead. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I played, uh, you know, back in those days, my, the first travel team uh, was at Pee Wee's. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I'm 60 years old, Lance. I know it's, I'm old. Okay. okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Your experience, experience. Yes. Um, so I played for the Iredale traveling teams and then I went to Totino Grace for high school, um, uh, where I was the leading scorer on the junior varsity in ninth grade. Um, uh, something I was very proud of at the time, uh, <laughs> and uh, played through high school. Uh, I, I, the best way I say it is is I was one of the better players on a very very poor team, um, and and the Irondale guys I had played with ended up they were very good. That was a great group. They ended up going to three state tournaments while I was in high school. Uh, we won less than half our games at Grace, um, uh, but. Uh, we got through it, and uh, then when I went to uh, college, I went to St. John's University, um, and I got enticed to play rugby, and I actually dropped hockey in college. I played rugby through college and then after college. Um, and uh, this is something, this is for all you newly retired guys out there, hockey wise. Uh, <laughs> conversation I'm, I'm sitting at a bar with a friend I was about 34 years old maybe and he says his name is Marshall Everson uh, his sons both played for Edina uh, uh, he said you play yep. hockey and I said I played in high school I haven't skated much since he said well we need an extra guy for Monday night and uh, you'll fit in you'll be fine right so <laughs> well you go on the ice the first time after years, the, the, my hands weren't that good anyway. <laughs> they were not yeah, there at yeah. all. But long story short, that's 25, 30 years ago. I still play hockey twice a week, skating with the same group of guys. Uh, and it's I, I just love it. We're not fast. We're not good. Uh, we're not even competing that hard most of the time. But it's a, it's, it's a wonderful game. That it's, it's a lifetime sport, which... I didn't know when I was playing as a young man. That's funny because I, I I did a little bit when I retired from playing. Um, they had coaches hockey here in Wyzetta. Uh, they had a couple games. He'd get in uh, like Thursday nights or whatever, you know, at ten thirty at night, and I, I did that. But I didn't know how important like the Sunday morning games are until I became business partners with a guy up in Canada. Uh, they they have someone in the group that he's involved with. They have like the 11 a.m. Sunday morning slot. I mean that they, the person's had it for over 40 years. Yeah. They're not giving that away. <laughs> no, so it is a it is a lifelong game, and uh, so you know you you chose to to go to a a different school, a private school, because you didn't think that you would get much playing time and your experience would be uh, much better going to a, a different school. Do you regret it now that you saw the, the success that they had? Well, so I chose to go to Totino Grace because my parents said, you're going to Totino Grace. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and frankly, if, if I would have lasted long enough, I maybe could have made that Irondale team as a senior. You know, I was a sophomore on the Totino team. Uh, and no, I don't regret it because I, I think probably what, you know, at the time I, I look back at it and I was, I was not jealous at all. I was super excited that my friends were all in the state high school hockey tournament uh, and happy for them. And maybe that's because it wasn't like they took it away from us in the section final, right? We were not, those days, they only had one class. We were a small school. We had to win because we had to play a play-in game. My senior year, to get 
to the state tournament, we had to win seven games. <laughs> and, and, you know, and you start out like with playing um, a bad team and we won that game. And then we played one of the top seeds. And then if we'd have won that, we'd have played another remaining top seed and so on. Uh, so we never had a chance, at, 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 not because it wasn't fair, Lance, because we weren't good enough. Right. Um, so I never was, I've looked back on that and I've never felt jealous of them. Um, uh, because I think it's because we just weren't competitive. Um, yeah. And and, I, and and now many decades later, well, if I'd have played there, I may not have lasted. I may have played a year to a JV and just scrapped it. Because um, yeah. I wasn't, you know, we had a guy from their JV junior year um, come to our team and became a top four defenseman. I mean, that's, that's just who we were, right? Yeah, yeah. So tell me about you. You you go to 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 college at St. John. You give up hockey and you're playing rugby. Um, we heard earlier that what your game is now is lawyering. Uh, when did that become something that you were going to start chasing? Was that before college or was that in St. John? So actually, I uh, I was in sixth grade. Uh, we had a career day, which means you could go visit somebody, uh, you know, some professional and have an appointment with them. And they gave, you know, mom gave you a ride downtown. And I had three friends. We decided to do it together. And one of them had an uncle who was a lawyer. And so we went and sat with the lawyer and he had a cool office. Um, and I'll tell you who it was. It was Ron Meshbesher, who... Uh, many have heard of. He's a fairly famous in legal circles here. Sure, sure. And uh, he was kind enough to sit with these little kids for an hour. Uh, but it stuck for me. And from then on, I was just always, I, you know, even then I didn't realize, you know, I had to go to school forever to become a lawyer. Um, but I just thought that's what I want to be. So I just kind of, you know, clop one foot in front of the other until I was one. How cool is that? Um, yeah. You know, that it's funny that, that everyone that I interview, they, they have a moment where there's someone that outside of their family and, you know, their brothers, sisters, parents, and but there, there's a teacher, there's a coach, there's, you know, a lawyer that said something and it resonated with you and it changed your trajectory. So uh, you finish you finish uh, St. John's, you decided to go, uh, I believe I read University of Minnesota. That's correct. Uh, we're co-alumni, Lance. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. So how, how many years did you got four years under your belt at St. John's? Then uh, what, do, what do you got left at the uh, University of Minnesota before you start grinding her out? So, so law school's three years. Uh, and I sometimes people take a gap year. I didn't. Um, uh, I went straight to law school. So uh, I came out. And, and it, when I was 25, I became a lawyer, a full lawyer. Uh, but I almost forgot, Lance, but massive highlight of my hockey career. Uh, our law school had an intramural team in the University of Minnesota Intramural League. Uh, and one year we got to the semifinals and we had a couple of good players. We were, you know, it was, um, uh, but uh, we lost the semifinals and we're changing. You, you remember the old uh, Williams Arena where there were benches outside the uh, locker room. You didn't change in a locker room. You changed on these benches, at least when you're an intramural guy. Uh, yeah. Um, and one of our guys says, hey, isn't that so-and-so? I don't remember his name. Uh, but he was a member of the Gophers JV, which they used to have in those days. And that made him an illegal player for the intramural league. And the law school team appealed and we won in advance to the finals where, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, where we lost 10 to one, by the way. <laughs> so, 
Um, that is so great. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So you become a lawyer at uh, at twenty five. Uh, I, you know, I, I've seen Tom Cruise as a lawyer. You know, I've seen all Gene Hackman as a lawyer. Uh, how hard is it to get the bar? You know, to do the bar. I mean, is that just insanity? So, so it it is probably the most intense. Certainly, up to that point in my life, the most intense prolonged period uh so bar exams in late uh july like at the very end of july um and starting in may uh you're going to you take the bar review class so you basically do law school over again you're going to class every night or four nights a week and you're studying every day um just to all the stuff you didn't you forgot um, because it's like, uh, yeah, I think of a pro tryout, right? Okay. This is my chance, you know? Yeah. If I screw it up, uh, maybe there'll be another chance, but there's no guarantee of that. So, um, it's just, you, you gotta be ready. And the fact is yeah. in Minnesota, if you graduate from the University of Minnesota at this time, at that time, if you graduate from the University of Minnesota and you took the bar review class, one person a year failed. And it was every yeah. year and it was always one person. And nobody yeah. wanted to be that guy. And they always said it would be yeah. somebody you wouldn't expect. And in our class, it was. It was a guy I wouldn't have expected. And we had one guy who failed it. Um, but so it's hard. Uh, but once you get through it, you know, it's great on the other side. So did you um, acquire some, some learn, you know, remembering strategies that, you know, did you take a class, uh, you know, the way they, they taught you how to remember more effectively? Uh, not the not memory wise. Um, and I was blessed. I could always kind of hear stuff and look at stuff and remember stuff. Um, but what, one thing I did my senior year in college, as an addition to my schedule, I took a speed reading class and that's, that's helped me a lot through the years, uh, because it's, there's just so much. So, yeah. Okay. And I think it's a lot easier now to be, you know, trying to find answers to questions that pop into people's heads and, you know where you can, you know, get those answers. You go to YouTube, you know, I'm going to be studying for the bar. Give me best practices. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll have a hundred thousand different articles you can read. Yeah. Well, so my advice to kids going into law school is always the summer before take the bar review class or get a hold of bar review notes because it really hits just the high spots, but it can put you ahead of the other guys your first year of law school in terms of knowing what's a tort, uh, you know, what is a defeased estate. You know, these are things that people don't know if they don't go to law school. Yeah, I, I have no clue. Yeah, well, I can explain <laughs> it to you, but that's probably not what we want to talk about today. No, <laughs> no. So one thing that uh, I think a lot of people neglect, uh, and that's celebrating, you know, giving yourself a pat on the back when you accomplish a long-term goal. Uh, how did you celebrate once you passed that bar exam and became uh, a lawyer? Uh, so a friend of mine, college roommate, who took the medical exam at the same time as I took the bar exam, uh, he and I got a... Uh, train unlimited month long train pass and visited friends all over the country and uh uh by train for a couple of weeks um oh awesome. yeah it was fun <laughs> <laughs> really cool yeah yeah it was like a year railing in america and i mean how because there was there there wasn't cell phones back then was there no no we had yeah yeah so so you'd have been awesome. Yeah. So, so, you know, we made 
phone call said we'll get there about this time, maybe on this day, whatever, but we need your address and we're popping in sometime in the next two weeks. Yeah. Uh, so cool to be able to just unplug and just kind of go with the flow and see what's going to happen before you kind of dive into the next chapter of your life. Oh, uh, yeah, it was great. Speaking of the next chapter, so how how does hockey intersect back into your life? Because I'm assuming that it was you had kids that you got involved with uh, or, you know, how did the blades come into your world? So you talk about that 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 moment and, and I remember it very well as driving. I'm from Edina uh, or I'm in Edina now. Uh, I'm driving past the police station, City Hall, and they have a uh, board up that says, uh, "If you're not from here, especially <laughs> if you're from Cooper, you got to go through the metal detector right over there." Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. No. <laughs> By the way, do you realize that Cooper has as many long-term NHL players as Edina in the last 25 years? No, I didn't really. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, Jordan Leopold, uh, a couple others who I'm sorry I don't remember. And Adina's only Dennis Vath, yeah. Yeah, and Adina's only got like four or five. Um Wow. Yeah, so so it pat yourself on the back, Lance. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right, sorry, anyway you remember I saw the, yeah. I saw the sign that said Mike Coaches Wanted and my son TJ was uh, you know, we're gonna register him for mites and I thought Oh, that might be fun to coach. And so I decided to to coach. And of course, that my team probably had five or six coaches. I don't remember. Um, uh, but uh, TJ, so I ended up actually, the next year I'm the Mike commissioner. And the next year I'm on the board of directors of Adina Hockey. Um, you know, just, you know what it's like. You step off the cliff and all of a sudden you're wondering how the water got so deep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but all, all wonderful, all, all fun, almost all fun. And, uh, so a guy named Tom Hatch was president of Dino hockey when I was on the board and it was time to form the first blades team for the 1995 birth year. Uh, and my son TJ was a pretty good player. Uh, more importantly, his birthday is January 10th. Uh, yeah. which in AAA hockey means a lot. And Tom Hatch ran the 94 team. And he, uh, he's, in those days, they didn't really have tryouts. They were, you, you recruited players to come to a tryout. Um, and so you had to go. So, so he asked me to get involved with the 95 team. Uh, I had the was fortunate enough to be friends with Jeff Linquist, a longtime Jefferson coach, and Bill Brower, great hockey guy, um, and uh, great hockey coach too. And they both had ninety fives, and they helped me find the kids. And we started the ninety five team, and uh, then a, a year later because I was operating the 95 team. I was asked to be on the blades board and that was probably, that's almost exactly 20 years ago. Now it would have been probably 2002 or 2003. Yeah, that, that's right. Right around uh, the time that I got involved. So before we get into, you know, the coaching and, and that too much further, let's uh, talk a little bit about how, and when did the Minnesota Blades AAA Hockey Club begin? Uh, their founding members. What's that story? So that's a great story. The, the Blades. Um, the, the, because are they are they the oldest uh, AAA program in Minnesota? Or? Yes, we are the oldest and by far the strongest um, historically program uh, AAA program in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, actually. Uh, yeah. And it all and, and all of that credit, uh, well, most of that credit, uh, the heart and soul of the organization is a gentleman named John Arco. Yeah. Uh, he started it uh, in, I believe, 1993. Um, On the website, it's 89. Uh, 89. 89 was the first class, I think, the first 
Okay. The first okay. birth year of players. Okay. I may gotcha. be I may be wrong. Well, we're 30 years, so we do the math, right? So yep. anyway, long time ago, John, uh, John Arco, uh, I asked him why you started this hockey organization. Uh, and he said, well, I just got divorced and I needed something to do. And John, <laughs> and John was a longtime youth hockey coach. Uh, and uh, he, had, he insisted on a number of things. And that would, I think, all together become the strength of what the Blades are doing and have done for a long time. First and foremost, the Blades will always be a nonprofit. Uh, nobody makes, I, I've had my salary as a director doubled every single year from zero times two to zero to zero to zero. <laughs> um, uh, John Arco certainly uh, took no money out and put money in um, as necessary. Um, and so we'll always be a nonprofit. Um, uh, the uh, second principle is that uh, winning is a byproduct of development, especially at the younger ages. We don't really care if the Blades win as long as the players get better. Uh, and, and as they get to be 11, 12, 13, the Blades tend to be winning teams because of the development. Uh, and what I, and I think the third core principle is how we choose our players. Uh, and this has come straight from John Arco. That is equal weight. Uh, is he a good player? Uh, is he a good kid? And does he have a good family? And by good family, uh, basically the, the parents' job is to um, get the kid to the rink and support the kid, uh, and that's it. Um, and by, by doing this culturally, we're able to, if a kid is a, if a, kid is a, a, a cancer in the locker room, the Blades have the ability to just say, you know what, you're, you're bad for development of everybody else. Sorry, we got to let you go. Uh, and I, we actually did that on the 95 team to a kid when he was nine years old. Uh, and his, I saw his dad 10 years later, and he said that was the best thing that ever happened to him. He changed completely. He realized he had consequences for his behavior. Um, but, you know, that's so... If, if winning isn't the most important thing to you and making money isn't the most important thing to do you, for you, John Arco used to say all the time, uh, then you can do things for the right reason. And the right reason is to develop these kids as hockey players and young adults that can make their way to college and hopefully get some of it paid for. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting because you talk about the blades. It's not like this. I mean, Minnesota is different than uh, a lot of the United States in that uh, our AAA season, those teams are in the spring and we play community-based hockey during the winter. Um, and the AAA spring team, the Blades, they can, you know, they get players from all over the place while the community-based hockey um, you're, you're basically given the team or, you know, uh, you don't have any choice, but you talked about if the kid's a cancer, I've had a few, I, I changed the, uh, the Arco thing from being, it's gotta be a, as well, a good family. It's gotta be a great family. It's gotta be great parents. Cause, uh, <laughs> again, those can be issues. So here, here was, uh, it happened to me a, a few times. And if those people hear this, uh, they'll, they'll remember cause, <laughs> but I, I said, uh, this was the conversation with the parents when they became the problem. I said, uh, your, your kid still has a spot on the team uh, only if you don't come to any of our practices or games anymore uh, because you become a distraction and a problem for the team. Uh, thank you. And goodbye. And I never saw any of those parents again. Their kids continue to play on the team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, they. I, I've had the conversation where I've said, you know what, if this happens, we're going to have to cut your kid 
if this it's usually if this keeps up, you give them a bunch of warnings. Um, and when a parent who's you know acting like a twelve year old realizes it's actually going to negatively affect their twelve year old, they change their behavior. Usually, yeah. Usually, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are that? And that's so true. They do. Um, and sometimes you get, you know, I, I think that um, because hockey is such an expensive sport and when you're talking the blades and triple a, I mean, you're, you're going up to Canada. I mean, there's some, there's some cost to it than just playing winter season. Uh, I think that parents, you know, sometimes we get, we get, uh, stuck in feeling that because we pay so much that we're invested too, that we have a voice now. And no, that's not true. Your, your support role. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree completely. There's that's, you know, and, and they pay, you know, uh, because we, we don't have a pro make a profit. We're about two thirds, the price of some other AAA programs. Um, so it's cheaper, but it ain't cheap. Uh, yep. and, um, you know, some guy pays two thousand dollars for anything. Uh, you know, he expects to have some control, but they don't here. It's just, I mean, the the you know, we're and, and it's, you know, I I saw you coach and relate to parents. It wasn't like you never talked to them. It wasn't like you were on a mountain or something. Um, no, but just no tolerance for anything negative. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't the same as constructive criticism. Yeah. Yeah. I guess when we would uh, coach Dornbach and, uh, you know, with the 97s and I uh, jutting, we we basically would lay out the plan at the beginning of the year and say we, you know, every practice, every game is going to be uh, thought out. We're coming prepared with a plan. Um Please just give us your kid for, for this season. And at the end of the year, if you're not happy, you know, let us know. We'll get together for for a couple of beers and we'll have a conversation and we'll buy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, so tell me, let's get back to the Blades a little more here. Uh, what are the benefits of playing for the Minnesota <coughs> Blades than any other AAA program here in the Twin Cities? Well, um, historically, we're the we're the strongest so and we we are so development is so important to us and let me brag a little bit about this lance um i just checked the numbers um currently uh i'm sorry the, our current number of of division one alumni is 653 blades have gone on to play division one hockey uh in the NHL, currently we have there are 53 Minnesotans. 34 of them played for the Blades. Um, the uh, current Division One, we've got 206 current Division One players this year. We've had about 200 and some NHL draft picks over the years. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, Hudson Fashing's dad told me when he played for the '95 team, he said, "I never heard of the Blades." But, uh, you know, Hudson was like a six foot 12 year old, clearly had a future, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, his dad said, well, a friend of mine told me that, that yeah, if the NHL is a po real possibility, the Blades are one of the good roads to get there. Because um, we do have, we have, um, you know, look at the coaches, you know, you, Dornbach, Judding, you know, at the time was, was uh, coaching uh, Mankato, right? Yeah. You know, uh, we got NHL players, Division I uh, alumni, Division One coaches um, all over the place. And more importantly, we've got we, – we pick our coaches the same way. We're not going to – I've I've had to, um, at the end of seasons – um, make other arrangements when our coaches were NHL hockey players because, you know, that doesn't make you a really good coach necessarily. Uh, we don't care how famous the guy is. We want to know how he is with the kids and how we can develop the kids. And that feature, that focus on development 
and the culture, good kids, good player, good parent, and playing with the best of the best just lifts all boats. That's our philosophy, is you're, each player is there to make the other players better as well as himself. Uh, and it seems to work. I mean, it does work. Yes, absolutely. And one of the, you know, I talk about the benefits of playing with uh, the Minnesota Blades, if you get that opportunity, is a tournament up in Edmonton, at the <laughs> West Edmonton Mall, called the Brick Tournament. Uh, it, if you've never heard of it, um, there's a mega mall up there that the mall here in Minnesota was kind of modeled after, you know, came after the Edmonton Mall. They have an actual hockey rink in the center of the mall uh, with a glass ceiling. And when you're at ice level, I mean, the kids are playing, they, they could be in the corner and you can slap them on the helmet. That's how close you are. And it's just a really cool environment. And I was lucky enough to, to go to that tournament three different times uh, with my boys. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Brick Tournament and your relationship with them. And uh, if you don't play for the Blades, uh, I think it's now Team Minnesota. Has it switched to Team Minnesota? But if you don't play for them, you don't... You don't go to the tournament, right? That That's absolutely right. So the Blades have the Minnesota franchise. The way the brick sets up is uh, every province in Canada picks one team, exception Toronto picks two. Uh, and then uh, the United States is divided up into regions. And your job, if you control the team for that region, you're expected to bring uh, the best 10-year-old players in your region and to be competitive with the best 10-year-old uh, players in the country, uh, in North America. Lance, do you remember who the MVP of the tournament was when your brick team lost in the finals? Matthew Barzell, yes. I believe, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, yep. Um, and actually, I guess he's the second player tonight that plays for the Islanders that we've just mentioned with Fashing over there too. Um, wow. uh, Fashing was an all was an all tournament pick when he played for our '95 team. Um, the uh, it's you know, these kids are ten years old. The best players at ten years old, more often than not, never get to the NHL, but a lot of them do, and the players who came to get to the NHL often were among the best players when they were 10. And yeah. so uh, there's great highlights of Stamkos. Uh, although I, I've not, I don't think McDavid played in the tournament, right? I don't remember uh, ever seeing anything of him. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, um, but so what you do is you go up to Edmonton for a week and the best description for someone from Minnesota is that the Edmonton Mall, West Edmonton Mall, is the only one in North America that's bigger than the Mall of America. And what happens, these kids are 10 years old and you're playing all day. There's games all day going on. Yeah. And uh, people shopping gather. And, the, and so you've got these 10-year-old kids and they're playing in front of four or 500 people. And the citizens of Edmonton now know about this tournament. It's been going on 20 some years. And you, you talk to people all the time who say, yeah, make sure that I get over there one afternoon at least to uh, watch these little kids in action. Uh, and it is, by the way, uh, I don't think there's been an American team that won this tournament in what, 20 some years, Lance? No. Yeah. It's, it's a, had three kicks at the can. Didn't uh, we came lost in the championship to Barzell and the Vancouver Vipers? Uh, but it's a special tournament. I mean, we stayed right in the hotel there. You stay in a hotel for a whole week, yeah. Uh, and I mean, to prep these kids because uh, the first team that I coached was the 96s, and Greg Dornbach and I uh, we coached that. We took notes because we had kids coming up, uh, 97s and then 01s, so we took notes for that. And one of the things we couldn't believe was how hot it was in there. I mean, just to give you an example, 
uh, when I was coaching a regular rink here in Minnesota, I would have, you know, winter coat on, gloves, a toque, probably boots on too. Uh, in this tournament, it was shorts and a golf shirt, and I was sweating. So to prepare the kids, we had them wear turtlenecks, <laughs> and we practiced in this rink that had at St. Louis Park that has the windows in there. Yeah. And we they were so uncomfortable, but when we got to the tournament – uh, you know, we did that for about six weeks. When we got to the tournament, they went without anything on underneath the shoulder pads, and uh, they thanked us for it at you know because of the preparation because it is so warm there. But it, uh, that is a really tough tournament to win. Lance, it, did it, any it, of the mothers complain about what those turtlenecks smelled like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they can. I don't think they can di differentiate between the gloves and a turtleneck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that is that, so that is that is a really really special week. It's it's it, it can't be duplicated anywhere um, to be exactly the same. Uh, my kids, uh, my my older son played and won the state high school championship uh, as a junior, um, and his words were. This tournament is the greatest thing since the brick. Um, wow. Yeah. So, and, and you know, playing for the teams he played for, you know, he probably was in 50 tournaments between the two of them, right? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and uh, there's just nothing like it. So, uh, if you get invited on Team Minnesota to try out for Team Minnesota, you should try out. Yeah. It is. I mean, you, you almost have to remind yourself that these kids are only 10 years old because of how skilled and how the game's played. I mean, think about taking every top kid, just one kid from every neighborhood and put them on a team and then throw, put them in Edmonton for a week. That's what that hockey is. And it is incredible. And the one thing that it, it, it showed uh, showed our groups that went up there is that there's a different level of pressure that they had no idea yeah. <laughs> existed and they knew where they stood on a, on a, a you know, a semi-international level, Canada and U S uh, where they stood on the developmental chart. And a lot of times uh, there was room to improve. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, there's a, uh... Uh, one Blades player was a 2005 Blade, now at National Development, um, and uh, he was he still is a, obviously a great player, and he's probably going to get drafted this summer. Uh, but uh, when he went to the Brick, he said he's told me since that when I went to the Brick, I thought I was the best player around, and I realized that these five or six guys I saw there were way ahead of me and I had to work way harder. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we always, we always say that the tournaments and, and that's the best tournament for 10 year olds. And that's the best, you know, but at other ages, we, we go to the best tournaments against the best teams. Uh, and we always say that, um, you know, you, you have to watch what these other players are doing because in order to get where you want to go, you've got to be better than that kid. You have to be the best and all that's development. And it's nothing okay. like actually seeing a player, actually actually feeling on the ice for an 11-year-old kid that, oh, my God, that number six is better than I am to make, number, to make that kid work harder if he's so inclined. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely. <laughs> I mean, it it opened up uh, a lot of eyes, not only players but parents as well. Um, it's an incredible uh, tournament. So, one of the things that uh, I want to go back to. I mean, that's again talk a little bit about how players get recruited for the Minnesota Blades today because it's different than when. Uh, you know, my kids, I think, were going through it. Yeah, yeah. The, it, the, uh, the Nowadays, there are so many AAA hockey programs. 
Um, back last year, back going back to my first year, um, uh, we had to play at we had to combine tournament levels because there were only about six or eight triple A teams in the Twin Cities area. So we had to combine age years to get enough teams. And now, of course, there's 40 or 50, you know, the, the designation triple A means nothing. You know, everybody calls himself that. Uh, there's a lot of guys who are in it to get checks. Um, there's a lot of guys who are in it for the right reasons as well. Uh, so what the Blades do now is, well, we start, we have a, what's called the Junior Blades program, uh, where uh, you don't have to try out for it. You don't get uh, selected for it. Uh, you just sign up and it is four or five, six year olds. It's a learn to skate development. We take the kids who are better and put them on one end of the ice. And we take the kids who haven't skated as much yet and put them on the other end of the ice. Um, and when we started that, uh, uh, my, uh, my, well, there was a kid there, my brother's kid who could barely get around the ice. Um, and that kid played on the blades for the whole, uh, all the way up and is now at national development. Uh, and he, 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 my brother says, yeah, the blades taught him how to skate and then how to play and how they developed him, but the kid really developed himself. I, you know, the kids always got to do the work. All we can do is give them the opportunity. Uh, so then when they get older, older, like eight, right. <laughs> um, we'll have open tryouts. So if you're interested in playing for the blades, you want to be watching the website, um, in August, September, uh, or calling and getting on the list because anybody at, at those young ages, anybody can try out for the blades. We will take anybody to a tryout. Um, we're going to pick the best kids way equally, uh, good family, good player, good kid. Uh, and, but anybody can try out. And at these younger ages, uh, if we have enough players, which we generally do, we'll form two teams, a first team and a second team. Uh, and then once you get involved with the blades, uh, then you're, you're on the team until, um, you know, you're, some kids don't put in the work, don't, you know, they just aren't that motivated. Uh, and, or they choose, we had, we had a guy in the 95s who, was from Coon Rapids, Minnesota. He was a really good nine, 10 year old hockey player, but then uh, he decided he preferred baseball. And by the way, we encourage kids to play multiple sports. Uh, so he was still on the team. His baseball coach said, you can't play hockey if you're on this team when they were 12 because they were really good. And he ended up being a catcher in the little league world series. Uh, and he washed out as a hockey player because he turns out he didn't like the contact. Uh, but he played high school baseball and I believe he played college baseball. But that's a kid that if we'd have told him when he was nine, you have to make a choice. He might have quit baseball. And what a shame that would have been. Yeah. So. Um, so that's I, that's the best way to get involved with the Blades. You can always email or call. Go to the website, minnesotablades.com. Um, and and we're always open to talk. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just will interject this, that, you know, at that, those younger ages, yeah, we're, you know, I was the same way when we're, you know, coaching that we want you to be doing other things. And I, it doesn't necessarily have to be an organized sport. Uh, I know that my, I could consider my kids multi-sport athletes, but after 10 years old, hockey was the only thing they played organized, but their multi-sportness was acquired at the cabin, you know, water sports, yard games, playing basketball in the driveway. Um, so, you know, you're playing for the Blades, you're playing for a top AAA program. You get to a certain point where you're going to have to choose. I, I don't see really any multi-sport athletes anymore, especially in hockey. Uh, it's too competitive now. Um, 
So you're going to have to choose. And, you know, we, we were honest with the parents that this is going to be, if you want to be on this team, that this is how we operate. We have to be the number one priority. Uh, and that happens, you know, right around 10 and probably 11, right around the brick time. So uh, just to get off the brick last, one more thing on that. That's where the relationships for me uh, became uh, really beneficial with these teams that we ended up playing and the coaches that we met because after that uh, initial brick tournament, then we would start communicating and say, hey, let's all meet at this tournament. So you would go, because I know a lot of uh, times you go into a tournament and you might have three games where you just walk over everyone and you don't, you only get two good games, you know, Yeah. once the pool plays over. So we started communicating and that, that meant, uh, you know, a lot better competition at different tournaments that we would go to. Uh, and at the older levels, just talking about special relationships, because I got involved. Let me, let me, Lance, let me, let me interrupt you there to tell you where your communication has led now today. It's actually been formalized in a series of tournaments for uh, eight, nine, 11, and 12 year olds, not 10, because it's the brick. It's called the brick series. And at every age group, there's three or four tournaments around the country uh, that only brick teams are invited to. Um, and so, uh, and, and we play in, in those. Um, and uh, that's where we get the great competition. And that started with those communications you're talking about. Oh, awesome. Yeah, well, it was, uh, we were just doing what we should be doing as coaches, and that's anything we can do to benefit the kids in their long-term development. Um, at the older levels, uh, where when you guys started the, the 14s, the 15s, and then you, you had the 18s, uh, you're giving players uh, an, another option instead of playing for the high school elite league or to players that uh, don't get selected for the high school elite league. And just talk about the, the relationships that you have with uh, Shattuck St. Mary's, Team Wisconsin, the Madison Capitals, uh, all the teams over in Michigan and Chicago. Yeah, so we are we – are, that's our project prep program, and they play from uh, – beginning of school year until the beginning of high school hockey season. And what we've been able to do, we're, so we're, we're uh, certified by Minnesota hockey, so we can play all the USA hockey sanctioned teams. Uh, and, and we have what is now considered the most competitive, highly most scouted, uh, 15 and 16 year old, there's two different levels, U15, U16. We also have U14 there. Uh, in October, we have a showcase where we bring in typically uh, eight out of the top 10 teams in the country. Sometimes there's a stray, uh, but they're all gonna be in the top 20. And it's Detroit, it's Chicago, it's Long Island. Um, and in the last, for the last several years, we've had every single division one team scouting that group because it's that they're looking for the 16 year olds to get the early commits. Uh, uh, and uh, we also have a very uh, generous um, attendance by junior scouts, USHL, NHL, and uh, also the NHL um, shows up there to get a first look uh, because we've got, you know, if you've got, eight of the best 10 teams in the country, you've got probably 50 to hundred of the best players in the country uh, all in yeah. one place at one time. Um, so it's a smorgasbord for the scouts and more importantly, an easy trip. So um, we again, so at the prep level, we're still focused on development. Uh, Craig Shermone, who runs that uh, part of our program, uh, wants teach what he says is I'm teaching these kids to play college hockey, to play hockey the way they play it in college. Uh, and um, we add to that development. Um, we, we help with placement. We, we introduce them to, we expose them to scouts. Sure. Uh, and a lot of our players 
uh, you know, they don't they don't need help getting, you know, if if you're a, a blue chip recruit, you know, you're getting all the calls you need. But we've also got some what's next to a blue chip, Lance? I don't know, but uh, uh, guys who are going to be Division One hockey players, but aren't as uh, top tier. They're not going to ever be an NHL draft pick. Uh, and and we can help those guys. We help place them. We work with them to find good fits. We know all the college coaches. We know all the college scouts. Um, we know all the juniors, coaches, and scouts. So we can find a place for these kids to play uh, who just want to get another jersey. I uh, I was with Jeff Finelli um, and a few others. You know, when you get in the fourteens and uh, he kind of, he was doing it before I was, so he kind of mentored me. And then you mentioned Craig Shimon, uh, with the 18s, but I, I mean, we go to these different events, one being the, the USHL fall classic and, uh, Jamie Fransworth, uh, Fransway, who, uh, is a behind the scenes miracle. I mean, we're, I'm coaching a team and she's got these, these, leaflets with the, all the kids in their stats and uh if they're committed or not and uh i mean just the first class job to really like you said try to help these kids get placed uh and to continue to play this game that they they love so much to play well i'm glad you mentioned jamie because uh i was going to finish up with her she is the uh current uh engine that runs the blades um I have, with John's passing, my title is CEO. Jamie is the president, uh, but she is the operation. And by that, I mean, she is the operation. She's our only employee. And yeah. she gets the ice. She finds the coaches. She communicates with the coaches. Uh, and basically, she calls me when there's something she can't handle, which isn't very often. Um, and uh, uh, without... Without John Arco, the Blades never would have been launched and become what we've become. Uh, without Jamie Fransway, uh, we wouldn't have gotten here either. I mean, when we would go to play Team Wisconsin over in Madison, you know, you got a bunch of guys that maybe uh, couldn't make it because they were playing a fall sport or whatever. Uh, so we have all these uh, pant covers and jerseys that we get. I drop them off at her place. She washes them at her house. <laughs> and I mean, she's unbelievable. I don't, I mean, yeah. how she has a family and kids, I have no and, idea. And while the, and while the, while the laundry's going on, uh, she's negotiating a high level ice contract for a season worth of ice with one of the other rinks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with Minnesota hockey on a level, high level. Um, yeah. yeah, she's the best. She does it all. So uh, speaking of a girl, uh, Jamie, you now have uh, girls teams. When did that start? Well, we've had them off and on uh, over the years. Uh, we've always tried to to do it when we, you know, there's uh, one one uh, coach or another has expressed interest. We should have a girls program. Uh, we haven't really been willing to have a girls program that where we don't feel we can develop them into college players. Uh, and there are other folks in the Twin Cities um, who control the elite girls hockey players uh, and do a great job of developing them. Um, and so it's not a niche we've had to fill, but uh, we're trying it again. We really, we. We believe we ought to have a top-level girls side as well, but as an all-volunteer organization, we are subject to the uh, whims of that volunteers, the effort they're willing to put in. So, well, um, I I train more girls now than I do uh, boys. So, if there's any of you. Uh, out there that want to start or take the lead with the Minnesota Blades on the girls' side, I'll make sure just contact me. I'll get you in touch with Jamie or Terry here, and you guys might have yourself a girls' program. We would absolutely love it. We, we had a good, solid program maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, 
uh, but then the, the the guys who were volunteering and running it uh, went to the wayside and and the it was never picked up again. So Lance, I I absolutely appreciate that. And uh, um, you know, geez, I wonder who would be could coach that team, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had I had knee surgery last March, and the next procedure is knee replacement. And the doctor said you probably shouldn't skate anymore, so I'm not skating anymore. But thank you for the offer. Was it <laughs> was it, wasn't there a time when Brad Buto said the same thing to you? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just a couple more things before I let you go. Uh, Minnesota Blades is a nonprofit. Um, how does how does some of the you know I mean Jamie she's whatever she takes it's not enough. Uh, but how do, how do these teams get a little bit of funding? Um, how how does it operate a little bit? How does this organization run? So so uh, fundamentally, uh, every team runs itself on a break even basis. So uh, every kid pays their tuition online, uh, and then. Uh, that's allocated to their team. We buy all the ice. We pay all the, the we pay coaches a little bit. Like most hockey coaches, they're not paid what they're worth. Um, and uh, there's a little bit left over, which we put into a fund that we use uh, for uh, kids who need the money. It's a, a scholarship program um, that all they have to do is ask. And then we'll fill out the, you know, we'll have them fill out their finances and get them whatever we can get them. Um, we're, my, my dream is to have a foundation so big that it's essentially free for all these kids to play. And then we don't have to worry about that at all. Yeah. Um, uh, which, by the way, all we have to do is tap into our NHL players to get that started. But that's another, that's another episode. Um, and, uh, uh, but so that our foundation, uh, and our scholarship fund is less than we'd like it to be, but we have enough to, to help kids who need it. Uh, if someone is interested, uh, maybe they have kids that, you know, don't play hockey or have kids that went through the blades program. They've been out of it for a little bit and they want to throw a little bit, little love back. How could someone donate? Uh, go to the website and contact Jamie Fransway because uh, okay. uh, that's another one of her jobs and uh, she will talk you right through it and, and, sh and she knows exactly what to do. Well, Terry Moore, thank you very much for the conversation and the insight into the, to the Minnesota Blades history. Um, you know, I want to thank you for you know my almost two decades of being part of that uh, organization you and uh, jamie fransway Artie arco saw her quite a bit the late john arco the founder uh terry zimmer greg dorn and greg and linda dornbach a lot of time there jeff vanelli and uh, craig shimon um just anyone else that you want to mention uh that it is this, such a, a great organization. My kids and all the teams and players that I was able to uh, be a part of uh, benefited so much because of all the behind the scenes work and the vision that all of you have had. So uh, anyone else you want to mention and just thank you for doing what you guys do. Well, you're welcome, Lance. Thanks for having me. And I'll just send a quick kudos back to you. Uh, I just counted our 97 blades, which you coached had 19 players go division one. Um, and uh, that's that's because of you and Greg Dornbach and Troy Judding did for them. Um, and I can't, I'm not gonna name all the coaches, I can't, but uh, I do wanna thank all the coaches and volunteers who have um, up and down for the last 25 years uh, created uh, not so much what this organization is, but what these kids are. And um, 
the only reason we've got 630 division one alumni is because every one of them has had a group of coaches uh, that cared about getting them to division one. So uh, thanks to all of those guys and Lance, thanks to you for having me today. All right. And the other people for the most part, uh, I want to thank the parents of all the players that, you know, I coached and I know the, the other coaches probably say the same thing that thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to work with your players for, for that period of time. Uh, it was a special uh, times. I mean, I, I just think of the first tournament that the, the O1s won up in Canada was in Vancouver. And there was a group of us uh, that went up to Whistler after we won the championship for a few days. Uh, three of them are playing for the Gophers right now. Mason Nevers and the Nevers, uh, uh, Mike Kester, and then my son, Rhett. Uh, <laughs> we were all up in Vancouver after winning, or uh, Whistler after that tournament. So, uh, well, it, uh, you know, we got 14 guys on that team, 14 blades wow. on the Gophers this year. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. All the years. So um, thank you for sharing the story. And again, this is a, a kind of tribute to to uh, John Arco and uh, his vision and how you and Jamie and the rest of the uh, board are, are keeping his dream alive and doing what's right. And that's uh, giving players the opportunity to chase their hockey dream. So thanks again, Terry, and all the best to you, my friend. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate it. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the history of the Minnesota Blades AAA Hockey Club and their CEO, Terry Moore. They're doing things the right way, and I'm grateful I was able to be part of their organization for over a decade. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.